So I'm going to talk about um, the system that we designed here called Ontology. And so we'll just get right into it. This is the little picture. And when you see this picture, you'll know that I'm talking about Ontology. Um, and it is a system that is, um, as Dominic mentioned, it's, uh, we use it for our permissions management. Um, it has a slightly more general um, idea behind it than that, though. And so we're going to talk about it in a slightly more general way. Um, but with respect to the title about it being a language-oriented design, um, there are two languages involved in the design. One of them is um, something from type theory. So it's a, it's a dependently typed um, language of data types. And we'll talk about that and spend most of our time talking about that. And, and then also, the other language is English. And um, because people don't want to read this, they want to, they want to read things in languages that they know. So um, we spend uh, some, we spend efforts to hide away all of the internal language syntax um, in the user interface. And um, so the system, as mentioned, is concerned with permissions, but also other kinds of like configuration um, at a high level that are sort of meant to be shared between systems um, <coughs> as well. And um, so the idea is we're, we're concerned about, for some given domain, what things exist in that domain, what relationships exist between those things, and um, also like what are the changes that people would like to make to both of those things. And, uh, and who is, whose approval is required before uh, those changes can go through. So um, the, the overall workflow here is, so there's ontology, and then there's the rest of Jane Street that um, talks to it. And uh, the, the direction we've been talking about um, here is that some configuration lives in ontology and is somehow gotten out into the world, um, either through some subscription or um, some query that gets called every once in a while. And also, uh, ontology itself needs to know about things, about other data that it doesn't have control over, um, so that it can um, say things about them. So like the stuff that we want to apply permissions to is um, sometimes under the control of some other system. And so um, then there are users. And users are looking uh, at ontology. And they're learning what are the permissions, what are the connections between the different things. And they are thinking, well, maybe something needs to change about that. And I wish I had this other permission that I don't have right now. Or I wish um, this other user group existed that doesn't exist right now. And so they make a request. And Ontology takes that request and runs a little query that tells it who is responsible for approving this thing um, before that request can go through. And it sends email to those people and says, please consider requesting this, or uh, approving this request. And then the user who is the approver, or whoever are the approvers, they can come back and, and make the approval, and it'll go through. Or they can reject it. So that's, that's kind of the, the background for what we're, what we're talking about here. And um, so the data that lives inside the system is the interesting thing that is represented in this um, language-oriented way. So let's talk about that data. So there are a couple of different axes you can um, look at and seeing what sorts of data we're talking about. Um, one useful distinction that we wanted to make, because we're eventually going to render this thing in English, is just at a very basic level in terms of like what part of speech are we talking about. It's useful to distinguish between data that is like plays the part of a noun, so like the things that we're talking about, versus the data that um, has to do with the things that we're going to say about um, those nouns, so the, the propositions that we want to be able to express about all the different entities. So that's the, 
the first uh, dimension is whether we're talking about nouns or propositions. Uh, the other dimension is the way in which we are going to go about defining that data. So how is it um, represented? And we have three choices here. Um, either we put the data in a table. That's one way. Um, the other thing we can do is we can define data by some rules, some logical rules that we define. Um, and then lastly, we can have some data in the system that is there, not because it was expressed in the language itself, but it was, it kind of like was hard coded uh, at the time that we built the system. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. I think this is a little bit hard to talk about at this high level, so I'll just dive into some examples. So first we'll talk about um, nouns that are defined by tables. And so these are the simplest data in the system, and these are just lists of things. So we have a list of users, and we have a list of HG repos um, where we keep certain things like code and what we want for lunch. Um, that's not true. That's just a made-up example. Um, <laughs> they're it, <laughs> the poetry is real. Um, and uh, user groups. So, and there's lots more things besides this. So this is sort of like I've, I've cut the universe down to a very small size to make it fit into a presentation. Um, and, uh, oh, right. So, so these are pretty simple. Um, and a lot of these get imported from the outside world. The, um, the next thing we want, might want to do is make a more interesting table that has more than one column. So, um, so here is a table that uh, stands for a proposition that some user is a member of some group. So each row in this table is, um, is an instance of, of that relationship and stands for some proposition. And, uh, and we define it by just enumerating all of the things. So that's what it means to define something by a table, is just to exhaustively list all the instances of it. Uh, and OK, here's another one where we have another table, but the first column has something slightly more interesting in it. So this is, this is the sort of data we haven't seen before. Um, this is a set of users. So. Um, I will talk about that next. And that, that was defined by a rule. So we can also define nouns with some rule, So <clears throat> our set of rules. So here we have uh, the data we want to represent is a set of users. And we have two rules in the system for saying ways to name a set of users. So the first rule is, well, if there's some user group, A, then we can talk about all the users in that user group, and that is going to be considered a set of users. So we're, we're just defining what it means to be a user set. So that's one way you can be a user set, is we can import groups and consider those as user sets. And then the other way to be a user set is to be a singleton of a single user. So um, sometimes you want to give permissions to whole groups of people. Sometimes you want to give permissions to individuals. And so these are um, two useful things to package up together um, into this one type of data. So that's what a user set is, and that's a noun that is defined by rules. Um, a proposition that you can define by rules is um, being a member of a user set. So um, user sets were defined by some rules, so now we need to define what it means to be in one, and we're also going to use some rules for that. So not surprisingly, there were two different ways to form user sets, and there's two different ways to be members of a user set. It kind of follows the, the pattern of the underlying definition. So the two rules we have, if you is a user, well, then you is a member of the set of users containing only you. Not controversial. And if uh, we have a user and a user group that that user belongs to, then when considered as a user set, um, the set of all users in G also contains U. So, so those are our two rules. 
uh, for saying, what does it mean for a user to be a member of a user set? Um, let's see. Another one here is uh, that a user may access uh, an HG repo. So, oh, right. So if you recall, uh, back here, we had a way to say a set of users may access an HG repo. But now we're interested in saying uh, this individual user has access to an HG repo. So we're going we're to define this proposition in terms of the other one. So it's basically just sort of unfolding the definition of the other thing. So uh, a user can access, an individual user U can access a repo if there is some user set that it belongs to that um, has already been granted access to the repo in question. So, um, so hopefully none of these things are, are very exciting to read off. Like, if they were exciting, then uh, probably they're wrong. Like, we would like to have some sort of comfort of that this all just sort of like sounds like it makes sense. So um, the last example before getting into how this stuff is represented, um, there's this pattern that we have where there's some uh, subset of, let's just say, users. So we have some type, some noun data, and we want to talk about some subset of those. So like, um, in this case, we have you know, the, the noun user, and we're interested in a subset of those users that have the ability to trade, that we're trading for. So um, we do this in two steps. We first define a predicate. Uh, we define a proposition that says that a user can trade. And, so, and, then, and then we use that predicate to single out um, a subset of the users that have that property. So the first definition here is the predicate, the user A can trade. And this is defined using rule. And the rule says, well, if you're a user and you're a member of this special user group called traders, then, OK, you may trade. And so that's the definition of who may trade. And then definition of a trader is, again, it's defined by rules. And we appeal to this predicate. So if you is a user and you may trade, then quotes around you is a trader. So this is like a slightly different object here um, that we're building up. Uh, so, now, so now we have the ability to talk about traders. And so in some other table, we might want to have some uh, permissions that only apply to traders. And so we would have the ability to say, well, we're not talking about users in general there. We're only talking about traders. And it would be um, data that we build up in this way. So, so that was the map that we had set out for ourselves. Um, oh, I said I was going to talk more about primitives. Um, so I'll, t I'll talk about them on the next slide. Um, so here are all the examples that we just went through. And here's sort of where they fit in this map of, uh, in, this, in this taxonomy of all the places where all the ways in which we can um, define things. And it is usually the case that we define um, relationships, these propositions, in terms of nouns. Um, and it's also usually the case that we define um, things by rules in terms of things that we've already defined in terms of tables. But um, I wanted to point out that that's, that's not always true here. So one example is we have um, this uh, definition 7 here was the table containing all of the um, user set and HG repo pairs, where the, all the users in that user set have access to the HG repo. So that was a thing that was defined in a table, but the, uh, the data that lived inside that table was defined in the first column here, the user set. That was defined by some rules. 
And uh, the other example where it kind of goes against the grain here is this um, the subset type of traders. So it's normally the case that uh, propositions are defined in terms of nouns, but here um, this uh, trader um, noun here, number five, is defined in terms of the, uh, the predicate that says who may trade. So um, the point here is that these things can all depend on each other in interesting ways. It's not like there's just some sort of like hierarchy of these things. They, they can kind of like um, fold back on each other. Um, so so now, that, now that I've set a bunch of examples, um, I want to say that um, I want to kind of relate this back to databases. So, um, so the primitives um, that we have in the system, I, I should have given some examples of that too. The primitives are things like um, port numbers or IP address ranges or um, things that are of interest and we want to like configure something to have, you know, um, that mentions some of these data. So like maybe we want to set up some firewall rules or um, I think another one that we recently added had something to do with like for a given location, like what's the maximum bandwidth that we want um, the network to be able to support coming into and out of that location. Um, so, so those are types that are primitive nouns and um, we can't really define them in the system. They don't, they don't follow this pattern. They don't follow any of the patterns that we've shown so far. But so those are just, those kind of just come with the system. Um, in the same way that when you write a program in a language, you don't have to define all the types that you use. You get strings or integers or some, some types are basic enough that they just come with the language. So that's what, that's what we mean by primitives. And there are primitive nouns and primitive relation, uh, uh, sorry, propositions. So, um, so both those things can exist. And so when thinking about how does, does this system compare to sort of a regular relational database, um, I think basically if we just had tables and we had some sort of primitive types, then that would be, this would, we would be approximating a relational, relational database. Um, if we threw away the tables and we try to define everything in terms of rules, um, then I think basically what we would have is some sort of a, a variant of prologue. Um, so everything is defined by some sort of inference rule, and um, and that's what that would look like. And so, but we but we have all of these things together. And so the mixture of all of these things together is um, I think the right way to think of it is as a, a deductive database. This is some term um, I think that used to be popular decades ago, um, and. But you don't see very many of these. So is it like Yes. And so, um, so that's basically what we have. And when, when you think about comparing this to a relational database, there are things like these um, subset types um, that I think are pretty straightforward to do here. And I'm not going to claim that you couldn't do this in a relational database, um, but mostly that I don't think I would know how to do it straightforwardly. And um, the other thing that you can do is um, it's pretty easy to define like transitive closures of things. So um, one example that we have uh, internally are mailing lists that are themselves subscribed to other mailing lists. And so if you want to know what are all the mailing lists that you belong to, you kind of need to like follow this chain of mailing lists until you they stop being you know, deeper and deeper mailing lists that you're subscribed to. And um, this is a sort of a, just writing that proposition with a recursive rule is not a hard thing to do. Um, so, okay, so, so now I want to talk about how are all these things represented. So now we're going to get into uh, type theory stuff. And, but before we do that, I first want to talk about um, a simpler notion of types that exist in um, functional programming. So languages like OCaml or Haskell, um, they have a notion of a variant type. 
And um, I feel like I should say something about this since this is very close to the flavor of types that exist in ontology. Um, but these are not very well represented in the world of programming languages. So, um, so a variant type is basically like a union type in C, um, except with safety guarantees, with, which don't exist in, with union types in C. Um, you can also think of it as a generalization of an enumeration type. So, so here are three examples. Um, we have a type of Booleans, a type of exit codes, and a type of trees. So the Booleans are um, defined to be either true or false. That's all you get with Booleans. Those are the two ways you can make a Boolean. And so we're going to call these two names true and false. Um, we're going to call these the um, data constructors. And bool we're going to call the type constructor. Um, exit code is only slightly more interesting in that one of the constructors, namely error, has some extra data that comes along with it. So, um, but again, these are the two ways that you can form an exit code. You can be the success exit code, or you can make one that's an error if you happen to have an int um, that you want to consider as, as the code for the error. Um, and then the most complicated one here is um, a binary tree. So this is how we can, if we, if we allow ourselves to make recursive reference to the type we're defining, then we can, um, we can define a tree structure like this. So a tree is either a leaf containing some character or uh, a node with a left subtree and a right subtree and some integer data uh, there at the internal node. And so um, we, we build up trees by like applying these constructors. So here's a pair of trees that I've defined. Um, so the first one, is that tree. And then the second one is slightly larger, and it's that tree. Um, so, so those are variant types. And um, the other interesting thing that you can do with variant types besides building them up is tearing them down. And the way that you do that in languages like OCaml and Haskell is with um, pattern matching. But because that's not what happens in ontology, I'm not going to talk about that. So we'll just talk about like forming the data. So, um, so now let's take these three types and try to translate them into um, ontology's internal language, which we're now starting to talk about. So, um, so like, we, like I said, when you're defining uh, Booleans, the Boolean type, you're really defining three constructors. Um, the first constructor, uh, or three constants, if you will. The first constant is a, a constant of type type. T, a bool dot t is a type. And so that's what the colon means. You can read the colon as a is a relationship. Um, and then bool dot true, we're going to be um, precise about the, uh, the scopes of things here with these. The bool dot is sort of a, a path that gets you to this constant true. Um, so bool dot true has, is a bool, so it has type bool dot t. And then false is the other constant that we've defined. And so that is the same sort of content of the definition from the previous page. Like we, we've introduced these three constants. And that's that. Um, and then with exit codes, it's sort of the same thing, except in the, the case of this error exit code, um, in order to get an exit code, you have to first apply the error constructor to an int, a value of type int. Um, and then the trees are the same way. It's just that now we can build up larger and larger trees by sort of like nesting these applications um, more and more deeply. Um, so, so that's the syntax that we have. It's a very S expression inspired syntax since we're very fond of those around here. Um, the, uh, but, other, but other than a few extra parens, it's, it's um, something that you might see in some sort of type theory literature where you have types and you have um, bindings 
uh, that are assigning those types to certain names. So let's convert some of our data that we had before into this new form. Um, we have this uh, user data. So we have this table of users. So this is pretty straightforward. We can just think of this as some sort of an enumeration type. What is a user? Well, a user is either the user admin, or it's the user B. Smith, or C. Jones, et cetera. And we have this finite list of all the different users that came from our table. And that's how we're going to define it in this, um, in this notation. Uh, one thing that changed from the previous slide to this one is uh, here I had been saying type in a few different spots. Um, that first distinction in our taxonomy of data of nouns versus propositions means that we're not, um, we don't, we have two ways of saying the word type in ontology. We can say noun and we can say proposition. And both of those are ways of saying that we're declaring a type. And then additionally, we have this extra annotation here that says essentially whether we're defining a table or are we defining a um, something by rules. And so the way that you say this in the language, the, there's a keyword extensionally, which means you're defining a thing that's kind of like, supposed to act like a table. Uh, and then there's another keyword intentionally, which means you're defining a type that's supposed to act like it's defined by rules. So HD repo, same story, user group. This is the exact same pattern. Um, it's here just for completeness. So now let's talk about uh, taking a proposition table and, and representing that. So this one is going to look a little bit different. Um, so first we have, this is the relation that we're trying to capture, uh, that a user A is a member of some user group B. So that is, uh, that proposition isn't really complete until we supply an A and a B. So the constructor that we're, the constructor that we're going to define to represent this table is one that takes uh, two arguments before it returns the proposition. So user.group.member.t has to be supplied to a user group and then a user before what results is a proposition or a type. Um, and again, we have the annotation here extensionally that says we are going to treat this as a table. So the way that we convert our table here into these declarations is each row stands for some proposition. Uh, the first row stands for the proposition that the user B. Smith is a member of the user group Human Resources. Resources. And so um, that proposition we represent by applying this type constructor to first a user group and then a user. So, so this is the same data from that row. But this thing is a proposition. Um, it's a type. So we need, uh, in order to have a declaration here of a constant, we need some name for the constant that has that type. And so we just make one up. Um, it's not really important. All the information here is really in the type. Uh, the name of the constant that we pick here is something that is picked by the system. So someone at some point came and said, I want this to be true. And they told the system, please make it true. And, and the system received this proposition that it could parse. And it said, OK, I'll add it to my list of declarations. And I will generate for you this identifier. Um, and the identifier is basically just some name that stands for this fact. Um, it can be referenced later on. If we need some sort of evidence that, that this fact is true, we can have this name as sort of a shorthand um, and then just look it up and make sure that the proposition we expect is the thing, is the type that that name has. 
Now this no longer looks that much like a variant type, like I was talking about. Um, however, so in a sense, it's, it is still kind of like an enumeration type. None of these constants take any arguments. Um, but what's weird about it is not all of these constants have the same type. So this is um, reminiscent of another feature that comes from functional languages called generalized algebraic data types, which are like variant types, but you sort of relax the uh, restriction that all of the constructors have to return the exact same type. And instead, you, you merely insist that they all return types that sort of start out the same. So all of these constants here have types of the form user group member t something something for different values of something and something. So, so we're, still, we're still kind of in um, variant type world. Uh, it's just that it's, it, we're, we've generalized it now. So we're in um, GADTs are sort of what's going on here. Um, OK. All right. So now that's tables. Now let's talk about how we can define things by rules. So the example, the first example we had of uh, a, a noun defined by rules was a user set. And we said there were two ways to form a user set. Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to turn that into a type definition again. So here we're saying it's a noun and it's defined intentionally, which again just means by rules. And each one of our rules on the left-hand side is going to become a uh, constructor on the right-hand side. So this first rule that said, well, if you give me a user group, then I can sort of relabel it and call it a user set. Uh, so that's what this constructor says. It says, well, one, one representation of a user set is just a user group um, wrapped in this particular constructor that we've chosen to name in a way that's kind of suggestive of the way we're thinking of um, that type of set. And then the other rule says, well, if you give me a user, then I can rebrand it and tell you that it's a user set. And so that's exactly what we're doing here. We're saying uh, singleton set for a particular user can be represented using this singleton constructor. And, and now we're back to sort of like normal variant type territory here. All of these constructors are returning the same type, user.set.t. Um, so this is a thing which we could have defined back on that previous page with the variant type examples. Um, we could have represented this in, in, a, in a usual language with variant types. So that's that. That's, that's how we represent um, user sets. So that's an intentional noun. Um, oh. Uh, oh, and now that we have, there was one extensional proposition that we had left behind. Uh, we couldn't really talk about it yet since we didn't have user sets. But now that we do, we can talk about it. So, so HG repo membership uh, specified at the level of user sets can be represented this way. So again, we are dealing with a table. And again, we have the pattern that all of the constructors that we use have these obviously system-generated names. And uh, the only difference here is that this second argument to the type constructor is a user.set.t value. So here, the first uh, row, we had the user set in question was one of these all in group user sets. And here we can see that clearly on the right hand side. Uh, and then all the other ones were singleton sets with, that just granted permission for an individual user. And so that's what we see here with, with using these singleton constructors. Um, there, there's some uh, inference going on here of the path. So, so when the type checker comes along and says, hmm, let me make sure that this thing is well formed. Uh, well, I know that, I know that hg.repo.member.t is a thing that returns a proposition, so that's good. 
that's something that's allowed to appear on the right-hand side of a colon, since prepositions are types. Um, but let me make sure that this thing is applied correctly. So let me make sure that this first argument is an HG repo and its second argument is a user set. Well, OCaml dash code When we say that, we're really talking about this thing. So the type checker at that point knows it's looking for a thing of this type. And it's only told this part of the name. But there's this invariant that all of the, um, all of the data constructors for a type and the type constructor that they all inhabit all have to live at the same scope. So this, this bit of the name is being inferred here, which is why we can, um, we can just get away with writing OCaml code here rather than HG repo.ocaml code. Um, and a similar thing is happening with this singleton constructor and with this one as well. So, so really, the only place where we have a bunch of path information is at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> OK, so that's an extensional proposition. Uh, oh, we already saw one of those, but that's, that's yet another one. Um, OK, now a new thing, an intentionally defined proposition. So here we're defining a proposition, but we're doing it with some rules. So again, um, these propositions are parameterized over a user and a user set. So we have those two arguments to our type constructor, uh, which returns a proposition then. And it's defined intentionally. So we've got that notation here as well. Um, and it's the same thing. We have each, each of these two rules becomes a uh, declaration of a, a new constant. And so let's. Let's look at the definition of the first one. So this one says, if you is a user, then you is a member of the user set, which is just the singleton containing only you. And here is that same thing said in our type, as a type. So the type of this singleton constructor says, for all users you, it is the case that this proposition is true of you. And this proposition says that you belongs to, or is a member of, this set, which is the singleton set containing you. So, so this is how we represent all these things. Now, something new is happening here, where the type, all the types that had arrows in them before kind of looked like this. There was some type, and then an arrow, and then another type, and then another arrow, and then, um, and then Eventually, we run out of types. But now, we have an interesting thing where instead of just a type on the left-hand side of this arrow, we have a name as well. So what we're doing here is we're saying um, the type returned by the singleton constructor here is going to depend on the argument that we pass in to that constructor. So that is something new and interesting that um, goes by the name of dependent types. So we have a, um, now it's not even the case that if we define, uh, apply a singleton to, um, if we apply it to different arguments, we're going to get different types out. Uh, so, and, and that's, that's really what we want. We want this to be some sort of a logical rule. This is sort of an inference rule that we're, we just happen to instantiate it to a particular user. But it really says a bunch of, this is our way of proving a bunch of facts of this shape um, by supplying different values for you. And, and the second rule is kind of similar. So uh, again, we, we have, we're pretty, we're saying for all user groups G, for all users U, uh, such that U belongs to G, then if all, that's, if all that is true, then we have a situation where U is a member of the user set G. All right. Um, Oh, and this is, again, just us unpacking the definition. So we had, we had a way to say that 
and whole, user, whole sets of users had access to a repo, and we want a way to say that individuals have access to a repo. And so I hope by now these things feel um, pretty straightforward. Like this is, we're just converting all of this English into, into the language that we've built up for ourselves. So, um, and again, this constructor has several of these arguments where the value that we pass in is something that we can mention later on in the types of the other arguments that come after it. Um, so, all right, let's see. Oh, and, here's our, and here's our subset type. So our subset type, we had this may trade relation. It's another intentionally defined proposition. Um, and then we have an intentionally defined noun that just packs this up. So, so if you think of this as a data constructor, like we have our type, it has a single constructor. That constructor takes two arguments. That argu the two arguments are a user and something of type user may trade t u. So like, we should think of this as some evidence for the fact that this user may trade. And um, that is going to be built up using all of the constructors we gave for that type. Um, but basically, when you're building up a term whose type is a proposition, you're essentially building up a proof. And so what this constructor says is, what is a trader? A trader is a pair of a user and a proof that that user may trade. So um, that, that's, that's the way that we build these subsets, is we're kind of like embedding these proof objects inside, inside the data. All right. Well, that, that was a lot to say. So, um, yes? Can you explain This one? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so we have this way of representing all of these different things. And what we're doing is we're representing it as a sequence of declarations in this typed language. And that means that we have sort of in, implied in what I'm saying is there's some type checker that we can run over all of this data. And it could say, no, your data is bad. Or it can say, OK, this all checks out. Um, so that's useful. And obviously, we'd like to maintain some invariant that at all times, our, all of our data are well formed. And the type checker would say, this looks great. And an interesting consequence of that, I think, is that um, so there's one there's like one very simple way that uh, the type checker might complain is if we try to reference a thing that is no longer defined. So if I if I mention some constant and that constant is no longer in the set of all the declarations of constants, then the type checker would say, no, that um, this is no good. So what that means as a consequence of this invariant that we want to maintain is if I ever delete uh, a user group, let's say, I need to go and delete all the mentions of that user group. All right? Meaning all of the statements of fact that like this user belonged to that particular user group, uh, or all of the user sets that mention that user group, and all of the HG permissions assigned via user sets defined in terms of that user group. And so like, there's a bunch of downstream cleanup that can happen, or that has to happen, if we're going to maintain this invariant. Um, and this turns out to be a useful thing, because um, it's not good to have all this meaningless data lying around. And, and so having this, this constraint at, at the heart of our system means that it sort of forces us to clean up stuff when, when we get rid of things. It also means that it can be partic particularly expensive to delete things, um, which is why we also we don't really, really delete things um, until like two weeks have passed. Um, we remember all the things that we deleted. So there's like a little trash can, I guess. Um, another uh, thing that happens um, because of this sort of cascading delete idea 
uh, is when we assign read permissions to these different constants. So different users in the firm have the ability to see the data that lives in the system. And you can say, oh, this particular constant can't be viewed by so, such and such. And um, what that means is uh, whenever we go to look something up, we have to kind of make sure that whoever is doing the looking up is allowed to see the thing that they're looking at. And this has this sort of transitive behavior where we go back in the other direction. Like, well, I, you know, am I allowed to see this thing? Well, what is it defined in terms of? It mentions that and that. And OK, let me check, am I allowed to read those things? And so we have to kind of like go back in the other direction to make sure that we're allowed to, to read uh, the things that we're reading. So the system takes care of that. And what this means is if you have a bunch of interesting read permissions in the system, it's as though different users have their own personalized view of the data in which everything that they're not allowed to read has been cascadingly deleted. Um, before they got there, or at least that's the that's the promise that we that we make. Okay, so so now we have all this data. We'd like to query it. So here's an example of a query. Um, and again, we're going to talk about the queries in English first, and then we'll talk about how they're represented in the internal language. So one one query here is I want you to find me a B and a D and an A of these types that have the following relationships. So the things, these three things up here are all nouns. And then the things down below here are uh, propositions that are supposed to hold of those nouns. And um, so what are we looking for? We're looking for a user A and some user set that they belong to. B and some HD repo D that they have access to via that user set. All right, so we run that query. We get these results. Um, how will we represent that in our internal language? So this is a new thing we haven't seen before, this um, exists keyword. And so the way that we represent a query is just a logical formula. There exists an A and a B and a C and a D of these types, such that you know, this thing is true of A and C. Okay? So this is a, a thing that can be either true or false. Um, it's, it's false if those things don't exist that live in that relationship to each other. Uh, it's true if they do. So evidence for the truth of this thing is well, find me an A and a B and a C and a D such that this last thing is true, and also prove it. So, so here are our kind of expanded query results. So this is, this is the same data as what I showed you here, except with um, two additional columns on the right that correspond to these, these last two proposition typed things. So, so now those are where the, the proof objects are coming into it. So, um, so let's, let's just look at the second row here. Um, so this is a user set. This is a, an HG repo. And B. Smith is a user. And C201 is the name for the fact that uh, of this shape, for, for the B and the A that came from columns two and one, respectively. And then lastly, uh, Singleton B. Smith is also a term that has this type. So Singleton B. Smith has, has a type that says that C is a member of A. Uh, which one is C again? C is B. Smith, and A is the Singleton B. Smith. Um, user set. So, so this whole this whole thing, you know, this is all type uh, well typed data that comes back from the query. So, um, but but the thing that we see um, is just the noun data. So, okay. Um, all right, and now now that we have 
all this data and we have the ability to query it. Like, we also want to be able to make changes. So just, I'm not going to talk that much about that, but there's um, basically um, different ways to change data based on what type of data it is. So uh, extensional data, um, some of it is data that is sort of under the jurisdiction of ontology. And for those, you can submit a request. And that's the story that we told earlier, um, where someone has to approve it, perhaps. And once that's all fully approved, then the change goes through. Uh, but some data is data that we don't have jurisdiction over. And so we just import that on some regular schedule. Um, and that's extensional data. Um, did I say all these things? Oh, right. And so what that means is for the extensional data, um, you can change the world by changing the data that's there and then waiting for something outside to like sync up with ontology. And so um, depending on how many different things are listening to um, what ontology says, this means you can like create a new user group or destroy an HG repo or add new relationships or remove them or whatever. Um, and then you find that, OK, now I can run HG clone, and it works because um, the permissions got synced out to the world. So for non-extensional data, um, those are not changeable by users. Those are changeable only um, by like, basically bumping the version of that type into some other type. And um, doing some sort of an upgrade step where we migrate the old data from the old representation to the, to the new representation. And at the same time, we like flip which one of these, which version of the data is visible. Um, and that's a thing we have to be careful about because we need to know which clients are paying attention to the old data. And so there's a whole story about that. Um, all right, let's see here. So now we want to render all this stuff in English. So uh, this part of the story could be more interesting, but it isn't. Uh, this part of the story is basically we have a bunch of strings that we've punched holes in that we just slap together in some sort of template instantiation way. And we end up with something that looks like English. So we don't really know. We know like the bare minimum possible about English grammar in order to get this job done. And that means that sometimes there are constructions that probably aren't the best. Um, this, this part could be done better. And there are, there are people who have um, whole careers devoted to like type systems for natural language grammar generation stuff. So um, I bought one of their books. And then I decided, no. I'm just going to do a very dumb thing here. So, um, so basically, every, everything, every one of these constructors has, uh, has one of these strings. And if you have strings for the arguments that you've determined somehow recursively, you just splice it into the, the string template for the constructor that you're trying to render in English. Um, so OK, let's see. I wanted to um, show you a few things. So I'm at a prompt. So I've, I've made a copy of the system, which is teeny, and only has the data that we've just, uh, that you've all listened to me tell you about. And so you know it by now. Um, so it's just a small amount of data. And um, oh, and I also have a, a particular set up here where I would normally have to type ontology and then the query subcommand to do a query. But um, I'm in a particular environment where I've set everything up so that all of those subcommands are just like top level things I can call. And it's obvious to the context that I'm only talking to my, my tiny little copy of the system. So yes? This is a bash prompt. Um, but it's uh, masquerading as an ontology prompt. Okay. So, um, so this is a private instance. Um, OK, so, so I said I typed query. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a query. And so I'm being asked, well, my current query is empty. Please 
pick some template for a query that you want to talk about. So I'm interested in working out um, what are all the HD repos that anybody in the developer's user group has access to. Okay, so, so first I'm going to, I know I'm interested in HG repos, so I'm going to, this is all based on some nice FZF um, tool that we've wrapped up. So some fuzzy finding thing. So I say HG repo access. I'm interested in that. So I selected that, and now my query got bigger. And this is the, this is the query that we were looking at a couple slides back. So I won't say too much about it, except that, well, this tells me about uh, HG repo access, but I also need to get um, you know, user group membership into the mix somehow. So I'm going to introduce another clause. And this clause is going to have something to do with user group member. OK, there we go. There's only one of those. OK, and now I haven't. Uh, said anything yet about which user group I'm interested in. And, but maybe I, maybe I get too excited and I uh, jump the gun. I'm like, oh, my query's done. So I say, N I'm happy with this query. And then it says, wait a minute. That's not really one query. That's two queries. You haven't like, connected these two queries in any particular way yet. Um, so maybe you want to join some clauses. So joining here, I want to join, like, so I have this D user and this uh, B user, well, I want those to be the same. So let me, let me join those two together. That'll like unify them. So join two clauses, uh, B, a user. And after I select B, the only thing of the same type as B was D. So that's my only option now. OK, so now, so now this time if I hit Enter, it would run, because this is a well-formed query. All these letters above the such that are somehow connected underneath the such that. Um, but I haven't yet told which user group I'm interested in. So I'm going to refine uh, one of these clauses about the user group. And here are all the user groups. Developers is the one I want. OK, so now what does this say? Uh, I'm finding a user that is a member of developers. It's also a member of a user set C that has access to E. That looks right. OK. So here are my, my uh, developers. And there's a problem that none of them have access to any code repos. They're only reading poems and ordering lunch. So, so now I'm going to solve that problem. Uh, so I'm going to go to the ontology website. And I'm going to say, I want to grant uh, some HG user, HG repo permissions uh, access. There we go. Grant users and user set access to HG repo. That sounds right. So I'm going to do this. And so I want to grant access to the OCaml code repo. And now here, the, uh, there's two ways that I can form a user set. Remember, I, I can be talking about some individual user or uh, some group of users. So I, I'm interested in giving all the developers access. So uh, OK, so that was successfully submitted. And now you'll see here, approval will be requested from the following users. This very conspicuously named user owner. Owner owns the data. So I'm going to switch over to owner's uh, login here. At this. this is an incognito window where I've logged in as owner. All right, so now owner has a, one request awaiting his approval. And I'm going to approve it. OK. Now let's go back and, oh, let's run our query again. Let's see. Oh, and the other thing that happened here is, um, I went through that whole like interactive construction of a query. Oh, I don't want to do that again. Well, good. Here's the query that uh, I can just paste in now. So in the language that I don't have to know because I just went through the interactive thing. OK, good. Developers have, can access the 
OCaml code repo. And uh, whoops. And the last thing I'm going to show is just what is it was it like to browse around on the website here. So this is where I think the this English rendering UI is sort of like the only thing you see. And you feel good because you're not seeing the other thing. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm interested in this traders user group. I've heard about some traders. I want to find out what's going on. So okay, traders. Traders is a user group. Let's see. Oh, here's some other user groups. All right. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back. And uh, so here's some things that the system knows about this particular user group. So uh, it's mentioned in this particular rule, uh, this rule that says who, that defines who is allowed to trade. Uh, and so here's, here's the rule that we had seen earlier. Um, I can go see everything of this type. This says this is one, one way to conclude that someone may trade. Oh, well, it's the only way. Um, and let's see. There's only one member of traders, this S. Welch. So I can go look at S. Welch and see what's going on there. Uh, looks like she has access to the poetry group. So I don't know, you can just kind of poke around. We can, uh, here we can see all, all the user sets that have access to all the HG repos. Just to look at that, we can sort of, uh, uh, I don't know. That, that's the website. So basically, it's just a bunch of English rendering of all of these, all of this data that was that is in that is inside in this internal representation. So that is that. So to to wrap this up, um, we designed this whole system on this little DSL that we plucked out of like. Type theory literature. How did that go? Um, well, I've I've talked a little bit about some of what I think are the upsides to this. So we get this sort of deductive database power, um, and I talked a little bit about what what sorts of things we get for that. Um, we were able to come up with this um, UI that's sort of data driven in a way that I think turned out to be pretty nice. Um, Again, there's probably still some rough edges. Maybe we should have done something smarter than just like slapping strings together. But um, it seems to work OK. And uh, oh, one thing that I didn't emphasize here, but hopefully it was obvious from seeing the, the demo, is that whenever we were constructing a request or constructing a query, like we were always presented with choices that were like, the full range of all the available valid things that we could do. Um, and in particular, we were, we were never allowed to go wrong, in a sense. So like, when I'm asked for, you know, please give a user group, I'm given the list of all the user groups. When I'm asked for a user set, I'm given the list of all the ways to form a user set. Um, I, it's sort of like hard to, uh, another way of saying this is that the UI because it's driven by the types, it's like guaranteed to only, it's guaranteed to respect the type system. So like the things that it produces in the end are well formed. Um, so adding new types of permission and config um, because of this data drivenness means that the heart of the system doesn't need to be upgraded. We just need, we can just upload these new declarations into it and um, and that's enough to get new types of permission in, permissions in. And uh, so, so one example of this sort of like very general approach that, that was a, a nice uh, thing that came up in the last year or so was um, we, we had a variety of places where you could, you could ask for permissions or you could also like ask for permissions to be taken away. And you can, you can ask for permissions to be taken away from yourself. And you should be able to just do that. Like if you're like, oh, look, I don't need this anymore. We shouldn't stand in your way. Um, 
you shouldn't need someone's permission to like, I don't know, give up your, your right to do a thing that, you know, if you're an adult and you think you don't need to do that anymore. Um, so, so we, so we had, you know, we kind of spot checked a bunch of these things, but we were able to basically like use this very general structure of the data to like write a test that knew whether or not, you know, for all the different request types for getting rid of a permission, it could like just say, well, let me try to instantiate this to like the person who's doing the requesting and then are they then allowed to um, push the thing through without any additional approval. And that was just a test that we could just write once. And that's been a useful thing to catch bugs. Um, so what are the downsides of this? Um, I think the biggest downside that we don't yet have a great solution to, um, although I have some ideas, are so this prologue thing in the heart of this language is, um, is Turing complete. Um, and that's not really what you want to sort of like live in the heart of your system. Like anytime a request comes in, we run one of these little queries to decide who has the ability to approve the thing. And um, one thing to be concerned about is that those queries might just run forever. And so we have um, some, some abstract notion of like the execution budget of one of these queries so that we can limit it and say, no, you can't run more than X units, whatever the units are. Um, and this is fine, and it lets us sleep at night, but it, um, it doesn't, it, sometimes it, it, the, the error mode is bad when you violate the thing because, oh, you know, that query was just longer than the ones we've seen so far. So um, we have some ideas about this that are kind of like zero in on the actually recursive types and the budget ought to be, ought to be sort of like more custom toward um, basically preventing recursion. I think it's a little bit too um, fine-grained a notion of a budget right now. Um, another downside of the DSL is, you know, you just have to like implement the DSL. And um, this meant that, you know, in this, in our case, like, it was kind of this hodgepodge of different things, you know, it was kind of like a database, kind of like a programming language, and so we had to like re-implement various small things from each of those domains. Um, however, one, one saving grace, I think, the only thing that made this um, reasonable at all was that this DSL is not at all an original thing. Um, basically, this, this notion of um, you know, having a dependently typed language of uh, constants and running a prologue back tracking search over it is something that's like a few decades old and is pretty well understood and like and and, and we were even like there are systems out there in academia that were even like more ambitious and we we didn't even go that far like we um, all of the data that we represent is sort of first order and um, all of the interesting academic work is about how do you deal with higher order data so we didn't even touch that like that's uh, we wanted we wanted that to be a simple aspect of it. So, um, so that's that. <laughs>